Pine Talk, Episode 12, where our squawks will delve us into the world of privacy, gawk at RTP's privacy, and tech tips with a couple of scripts and an amazing chips. Gain control of your hardware and software, don't forget to share. Though it's rare, you could also add some flair. I am Peter, your Linux phone and tablet procrastinator. And I am Ezra, content creator who's released a game. What? I know. But now, welcome to the 12th episode of Pine Talk. The podcast for the Pine64 community by members of the Pine64 community. In this episode, we'll be discussing a bunch of community news <laughs> and some <laughs> of your feedback and questions. Also, we're having another interview, as the poem hinted at. But first, what have we been up to lately? Well, I've been taking nice walks in the forest. A pine forest, no less. 64? A pine 64 forest. <laughs> but more um, relevantly to me, I published my point-and-click fan game, Televoid Out of the Loop, available for both Microsoft Windows and Linux as an app image. Uh, it was very hard, uh, and immediately after publishing it, or just around that time, uh, there was a lot of crashes happening on Windows that were really hard to fix and was mostly due to my bad code, but it didn't crash on Linux, so, you know, who knows why that's happening. I plan on making... Jokes on you, Windows. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's the thing. I don't use Windows, so I, I get other people to test it. <laughs> it's very fun. Yay. Very fun Remote experience. Remote debugging. The best. Remote debugging. But it's all compiled on Linux. Even the Windows version is compiled on Linux, which is pretty cool. Uh, using Mingu and stuff. Uh, I plan on making a video about my experience working for three years on a fan game. Gosh. Even I can't believe it took that long. Did I mention it was made in my own game engine in C? Yeah, it's pretty impressive, I know. That's cool. Uh, and of course, it is the game and the engine is completely free and open source. Brutal Moose, the creator of Televoid, the thing I'm making a fan game of, actually made a post on his blog about my game. Quite nice of him. Uh, I hope he enjoys the game as much as you do. What about you, Peter? What have you been up to? Well, I played your game for a bit. Uh, so I wow. didn't have much time, so I only spent like some 45 minutes. And I am clueless to the backstory of the game because I, uh, you know, I don't know what this is a fan game to, if you know mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say. Uh, but I liked it a lot and I enjoyed the visual and musical atmosphere so everybody try it out it's free uh will only eat your time <laughs> mm -hmm. if if you need to um if you want more context you can also check out rudomus's show televoid on his youtube channel ah uh, yeah sadly he doesn't have odyssey i don't we think. should put a link to that in the show notes this time i think yes Definitely. Good. So I've been uh, slacking off uh, again, so I haven't done any new videos since June 1st. Um, that's why I called myself a Linux phone and tablet procrastinator, because I've written a post about tablets. Um, so new Linux on tablets. And, well, with the Pine tab not being available, it's a bit complicated, right? Uh, if you don't want to spend 600 US dollars on a crowdfund or something. Um, but yeah, it's not too complicated that you shouldn't attempt it. So I focused on hardware in this first post. I hope to write more on the topic, but it's certainly going to take me some time because I want to do it right. And writing just about software in one giant post doesn't sound like a good idea, right? I would have to test for example, you want to touch on a tablet for real 
to write about it, not just watch videos mm -hmm. of other people using it, because then you don't notice where it's going wrong. But if well, if you're looking for such a tablet, uh, my post might be helpful. So I didn't go through all the used tablets out there that would be interesting. I just tried to outline what could work. Um, so like generally uh, avoid locked bootloaders and stuff. Um, and then I will also hope I also hope that I will be able to go into how to tweak your Linux distro to make it work on a tablet in a later post. So if you're not going for a specialized UI, but instead want to make GNOME work on a tablet or Plasma desktop, um, how to do that would be interesting, I think. But that's way too much about me and my thoughts on tablets. And let's get to it now and start with the app of the episode. Now, this is, of course, about phone apps mostly. Um, but this week, I'm going to talk about KDE Itinerary. Ooh. When I first heard of it, I was like, what is itinerary? Because I didn't know the word, right? Because English is a second language for me. Uh, and yeah, I hadn't heard that. But this is an app for phone desktop that describes itself as a digital travel assistant with a priority on protecting your privacy. And it is just that, with many nice, nice features such as timeline view of a unified travel itinerary with automatic trip grouping. It supports train, bus, and flight bookings, as well as hotel, restaurant, event, and car rental reservations. It has boarding pass management. It supports ticket management for multi-traveler and multi-ticket bookings. And yeah, it does so via automatic booking data extraction from various input formats performed locally on your device. For example, I uh, uh, took a German railway ticket. Uh, those um, are sent to you as PDF via email and put that into itinerary and it read out that information's information of the ticket totally correctly, and I could have used it to uh, travel like that. I didn't do that yet, but I look forward to do so this weekend, actually. Uh, yeah, it also has real-time delay and platform change information for trains, so that's certainly useful, and weather forecasts for destinations along your trip. Um, but there's even more uh, that I don't want to bore you with further. Uh, if you don't have a Pine phone or similar Linux phone, but an Android phone and you're a Plasma user, you can use it too. So check it out. It's really cool. And if your reg regional transfer providers aren't supported yet, well, maybe take it as an opportunity to contribute. <laughs> yeah. Well... Uh, you said that it has a priority on protecting your privacy and yeah well as such now it's time to talk security and privacy with rtp hi rtp or right to privacy how are you and who are you hey i'm doing well um i am rtp i go by rtp on my video channel my blog and I am someone interested in Linux and privacy and, you know, InfoSec. Okay, so informational security, right? <laughs> exactly. Good. So how did you get started with computing and Linux? Well, actually, it started when I was in uh, high school. There was a friend of mine in the punk rock scene and he was really heavily into a lot of um i guess you'd say the hacker community at that time and uh i just thought some of the things that he was up to was really interesting uh he was interested in phone technology as well they used to make all kinds of different you know boxes that did all kinds of interesting things uh back then and uh he got me into unix and linux and since then i've probably tried about 30 different linux operating systems <laughs> so you went down the distrowatch rabbit hole oh yeah oh yeah i even tried um 
Linux from scratch where you compile everything from source code and oh, yeah. that was uh, an adventure. You definitely learn a lot. Yeah, I, I did that too, but it's like 15 years ago or something. Yeah, yeah, it was a little while back. It's still around now. I never did that again because it was like... I didn't think I'd ever <laughs> want to do it again. <laughs> Great. Too much. Okay, so that's how you got started. And then uh, what are you running now? What's your distro of choice? Uh, I am running on my uh, laptop. I'm running Hunix over Cubes. I also am running right now a Debian virtual machine for this call here. And uh, it, it's pretty nice. It does a lot of peripheral... Uh, isolation and multiple virtual machine isolation for different peripherals, network devices. Everything's isolated individually. And uh, it's great for privacy and security. Hunix is a nice addition. It has a virtual machine gateway that acts as a Torified router. And the Hunix workstation is what the interface is that you work on. And it basically, you know... Torifies everything and also prevents IP MAC address leaks for the um, workstation if you set it up right. Okay, cool. So you're not just uh, talking IT security and privacy, you're living it. Exactly. I, I think you got to uh, practice what you preach, I guess. <laughs> That's uh, the best way of doing it, but not exactly. everybody does. So kudos to you. Uh, so, when did you first hear of Pine64 or um, the Pine phone or whatever it was that got you interested? Well, what got me interested in Pine64 was the Pine phone. Uh, the Pine phone is like a dream of mine ever since I started using Linux. It's literally the pinnacle of phones for me at this moment. I know that sounds huge, but it is a Linux phone that is a Linux phone. It's a full Linux system in a phone. And it double, it's just, it's not an Android where you have, you know, the Android rooted or a custom Android image. You can do everything. You can carry a full Linux machine in your pocket. And I think the potential there is huge for all kinds of maker projects. And uh, it's just, something that got me interested in pine 64 and from there i now have the pine tab which is also great it's like a bigger one yeah so that's what got me interested in pine 64 and from there i've just been sticking around and uh i really think pine 64 has a lot of potential to do some interesting things that's cool so i I mean, you already said you've got a Pine phone and a Pine tab, uh, so you've got multiple devices. What's your favorite? I mean, I'm almost guessing it's the Pine phone, but maybe it's not. You know, it's a tough one. The Pine phone is, is probably my favorite because it is able to do all the things that the Pine tab can do and then a little more with the cellular. But then I also see the limitations with cellular. We're seeing a lot of times pine phone seems to be almost blacklisted from certain carriers i know everyone calls it a white listing but i think it's really blacklisting when they're blocking the pine phone specifically um and i guess i see you know the decentralized potential of you know laura and the i love the built-in rtl sdr in the pine tab so I think for radio and control screens, the Pine tab works a little better just because it's a larger screen and a lot of times you have to deal with very tiny buttons. I, I'm sure you can understand how frustrating that can be on the Pine phone. Yeah. And um, so really it's a tough call, to be honest with you. I use them probably equally and I use them for different things. I'll use the Pine tab for all my SDR stuff and I'll use, you know, the Pine phone. You can also remotely log in through SSH. And I don't know any other phones that can do something like that. So I don't know. I just really enjoy using, you know, scripting and different things to accomplish creative tasks. And it's really up to your imagination. You really can do anything that you can come up with, basically. Okay, so... Yeah, I, th I believe that too. I mean, within the constraints of the hardware, 
the possibilities are limitless, right? And SDR is a software-defined radio, right? Yes, software-defined radio. And especially, like, playing with Laura and stuff, you can you can do a lot of the receiving and stuff, testing out different radio-related tasks. And uh, you can also pick up a lot of interesting things, like, you know, even, you know, first responders and whatnot. And all of that is... At least in the USA, I mean, you have to check your local laws, but as long as it's not decrypting any radio communications, it's all completely legal to receive radio. Yeah, that's cool. So I think you've been uh, tinkering with that Pine Dio hardware too, right? Yes. So how do you like it and what hopes do you have for LoRaWAN? Well, it kind of goes back to what I mentioned about the limitations of relying on cellular providers we're basically at their mercy with our communications and when they decide to phase out 4g i think there's going to be you know a need for another form of communication and ideally if we can come up with something that is more decentralized um, of course there's a lot of limitations within you know the laura the semtech laura protocol uh packet size and you know transfer speed but i think you know you can get a little creative and possibly you know mix it in with different types of networking and you can really come up with something unique that's usable and and laura could be good enough for encrypted text communication right yeah exactly in this episode later on we are going to have a little segment on a device somebody built not with Pine 64 stuff, but I think that's going to be of interest then for you too if you, you're going to listen to this later on. Oh, for sure. Uh, but let's go back to what you do and what you create. And So where do you get the ideas or inspiration for your videos? Well, for me, the inspiration comes from I try to put myself in other people's shoes and you know, I'm, I look at the trends that are going on and I try to, I try to look a little bit further ahead in the future. You know, a lot of people say, you know, what's the point of privacy? There is no such thing as privacy. But, you know, they, they don't realize that all of this data is sold, is aggregated, is sold by data brokers. It goes into everything from the price of your health insurance to if you get that new job. And this could be something as simple as going hiking. That can affect your health insurance cost. There's a lot of reasons for privacy, and I try to put myself in the shoes of someone else and try to look a little bit ahead and try to see what's not been done on video before. So I, I just try to look for gaps in uh, the tutorials out there if I find any and uh, try to come up with something original where possible when it's ready for video. Oh, that's pretty cool. You know, I always just pick something I'm interested in and do it. <laughs> I hear, no, I hear you on that. I, I do the same thing, too. you got to fill in. You, you can't have a constant flow of new ideas all the yeah. time. So uh, when you then create a video, so what's your workflow? I mean, do you write long scripts? Do you plan scenes or is it more spontaneous? I do. Yeah, I do it more spontaneous. But I will say, and this is something I suggest everyone do no matter what they're doing, Keep a notepad, and sometimes we'll get ideas for various things, whether it be a video, a blog post, or a script, or a program. And a lot of times I notice I can forget these ideas if I don't jot them down right away. And if you keep a notepad, you'll have a large list of ideas to work from. So that's how I start. And then I basically plan a day around whatever topic it is I'm doing. And I usually don't have any script written at all. I just kind of go off the cuff. Then I then I just edit out all of my ums and ahs and all my, you know, moments where I don't want to yeah. be, you know, played back. <laughs> so that's how I do it. I get that. Sounds very much like how I'm doing it. For those that don't know your content yet, uh, what is a video they should watch if they for example are pine phone users i guess i guess i would say take a take a look at the one on ssh that 
shows Hydra cracking the default passwords and just take your, you know, your PIN number security seriously. I know a lot of users have SSH open, and I don't know if a lot of them know that on any local area network they ever connect to, whether it's public Wi-Fi, if you're at a coffee shop, anyone else at that coffee shop connected can SSH to your phone. If your password's still 1234 or 123456, you might want to think about changing that. And that's one video that I would recommend just to PinePhone users, just, just to get an idea of how quick and easy it is if someone did have bad intentions. That's good advice, because, I mean, even some distros have SSH on and don't suggest you to change that default Exactly. Pin. So if people want to follow your work, how can they best do that? I would say the easiest thing to remember is odyssey.com slash and then the at sign and RTP at that point. And you can find links to everything else in the description. So, And then also falstodon.com slash RTP as well. Good. So we're going to put links to all your content and to that SSH video into the show notes of this episode, of course. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for having me. And... Uh, Hopefully uh, talk to you again one time or another. Sounds good. It's been fun. Thanks again to RTP for coming on. We will have the all the important links in the show notes. Uh, but for now, let's continue with the community news. Yeah, community news. The best news. The best news. So please start it. The first item of community news this episode is not really news, but a new project to keep your eyes on. Pine Root is a built root environment for PinePhone. Now, what is built root? It's a simple, efficient, and easy to use tool to generate embedded Linux systems through cross compilation. Quoting from the project page, single, a single make command produces your own image, which you can copy to a micro SD card and boot on PinePhone. PineRoot's default image boots to Wayland and starts LITerm for you. They even include PineUI Qt Quick skeleton application as embedded Qt5 demo for kickstarting your own developments. You can also utilize BuiltRoot toolchain with Qt Creator for rapid in device development. Their approach is simple, manageable, and embedded friendly thanks to BuiltRoot. Yeah, these are many words. Sure. Um, but they have a cool use case, and that is Pine Router, and we've put a link to that in the show notes too. Um, which turns your Pine Phone into an LTE root router appliance. So that's pretty cool, right? So if you mm. maybe feel that Pine Phone isn't good enough as your daily driver yet, but you want to do something with it, and you've got a laptop that doesn't have LTE built in. Maybe that's interesting to you. Yeah. I certainly recommend you to follow the project on Twitter, and we've included all relevant links into our show notes. Next up, Brian Daniels talks about hardware accelerated video decoding on the Pine Phone. As you may know, uh, I always test video watching on various OSs and devices. I like to test that because I find it's a good test of what modern functionality a device or piece of software may have. And Brian Daniels blogged about hardware accelerated video decoding on the Pine Phone, which um, was definitely a bit of an issue. Phones, the Pine Phone, anyway, for me, got a bit hot when watching videos. Yeah. Uh, but, but now, uh, we saw video acceleration, which at least on most ARM systems on a chip uh, is uh, different from the general graphics acceleration, as this uses the VPU and not the GPU uh, in use before when uh, Marius from Germany got video chat in the Element web app to work. So we did see that happen. But this now is about playback. And you need to build GStreamer from Git master and set a few environmental variables to get it working. Uh, 
What's great about using the Cedrus VPU is that uh, it reduces the total CPU usage. So that uh, it was 10, 11%, and the GST Play 1.0 app was using 33% of one CPU, according to Top, as Brian writes. Yeah, so you know me, I've been trying to confirm this. And it was actually quite easy, as Brian did this with uh, Dank 12's Arch Linux Arm, which is what I'm running to, and I can't stop uh, telling everyone about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I run Arch, by yeah, the way. By the way, <laughs> it's a disease. <laughs> Stay safe of it, people. Uh, well, so I was trying to be smart at first, and I figured, well, let's just install the GStreamer Git and various uh, packages like for example, gst-plugins-bat-git from the AUR to get this done. But the Arch user repository is not really made for Arch Linux, uh, which is not part of the official Arch Linux project. And thus, this would have required some adjustment to a number of package build scripts because I ran into the issue that it wanted to compile or install binary packages of some something Intel related which I was like well I don't need that that's nonsensical on my Pine phone I don't have so much <laughs> space these 32 gigabytes are almost full anyway so uh, yeah um, I could have adjusted those package build scripts I'm sure but uh, I didn't have the time nor the brain capacity so I went with Brian's instructions and decided to make sure that the Ninja install step would install this git build to not to use a local, but to slash user instead. Uh, don't do this at home. Uh, so um, I will <laughs> run into uh, some funny override conflicts once a uh, GStreamer gets an update in our training exam. Uh, yeah, uh, I set myself up to fun there. But to make a long story short, uh, GStreamer took quite a while to build, so it was actually more than an hour. Uh, it works. Uh, and his numbers check out as described. And yeah, once GStreamer 1.20 will be released, which should be according to the GStreamer website in a few weeks, we all should be able to enjoy these improvements. Um, oh yeah. But then GST play is not really the video player for end users. You know, it has no UI. Whatsoever, no controls, nothing. Uh, so I hope that distributions or new media player projects will so solve this video acceleration issue for all of us. In a way, that's better to use, but it's really impressive. So um, playing back 1080p video um, H264, I don't know about the frame rate, sadly, but it played back super smooth. I like 33% of one CPU core. Uh, I tried to play the same file in MPV and it was at around like across those four CPUs in top. I was at, I don't know, 230 uh, percent CPU usage and it was still dropping frames. So yeah, this is really cool. Uh, using the hardware mm -hmm. that's made for this helps mm -hmm. turns out oh, yeah. surprising <laughs> oh well, thank you brian daniels for uh well, taking yeah, the time for to... educating us <laughs> yeah <laughs> so next up infinitime 1.2.0 jf wasn't planning on releasing infinitime 1.2.0 so soon as many interesting features were in the works right now. Um, but uh, as was announced in Pine64's monthly update, uh, the factory cannot source the accelerometers or the accelerometer BMA421 anymore. And as an alternative, they propose to use the BMA425 instead. This new sensor is very similar, but needed a few minor modifications to the driver, e.g., taking into account the new chip ID for the BMA425, BMA for example. Uh, as the factory is waiting for a version of Infinitime that supports the BMA425, they decided to release the version uh, as soon as 
possible. In addition to the added support for the BMA 425, this new version brings one new app, many improvements, and bug fixes. The Metronome app was contributed by Britton Hall. It uses the vibrator to give uh, the tempo to the user and provides a nice user interface to select the beats per minute, the beats per bar for creating uh, an accent beat. The stopwatch app was also improved by Riku Izokowski. It now provides us a cleaner user interface. So thank you, Riku, for that. And thank you, Brighton, for the uh, metronome. The, this release also includes many behind-the-scenes uh, developments, mostly focused on memory usage optimizations. JF did a detailed analysis of RAM and flash memory usage and has already implemented a few changes that reduce the size of the firmware from 420 kilo, kilobytes kilo, to 340 kilobytes, about. And... To reduce the RAM memory usage, uh, they've also fixed a few bugs and implemented a few improvements in code cleaning. They're cleaning code and it makes things go vroom vroom very fast. <laughs> it's Isn't that just great? getting better. It's just getting better. And, you know, they're doing good also, uh, uh, being on their toes and adding support to new drivers when hardware is no longer available. <laughs> yeah. Now, let's move on. Our last item of news, which is the wider community news, news, news. And is something for LoRa enthusiasts. Yeah, we've b not forgot about you, right? So, on Hackaday.com, we found another story for LoRa enthusiasts among our listeners. So, there's a GitHub project called OTG Messenger, which reuses the shell and keyboard of a Nokia e 63, a non-touchscreen Qwerty <laughs> BlackBerry style 2008 Symbian smartphone to build a secure custom off-the-grid messenger. It works with self-healing mesh networking, which enables group communication over vast distances where devices nodes act as relay stations. So, you don't need any infrastructure. These devices are the infrastructure. It's based on a custom four-layer PCB, uh, which s schematics sadly haven't been published yet. So please note, this does not use 0.64's LoRa equipment, but it's still quite interesting. It's based around the STM32H7 microcontroller, and this is an example of what awesome stuff you can do with, in today's terms, quite limited hardware. I think it's still super interesting to see this as an application and we wonder whether something similar, maybe even compatible, could be achieved via PinePhone back cover or potential future 0.64 handheld hardware. But with that, let's move on to community engagement. Yes, and let's start with listener feedback. Whoa. Uh, on Dev wrote an email saying, Hi, I was just listening to episode six, caught up the rest shortly after, and heard your comments on, uh, on signal clients. It's been a little while since that episode, and the desktop app now works reasonably well on the Pine phone. Obviously, it's still not mobile optimized, but it is workable for daily use. The only caveat is that the building it is an in-depth process, even with the build scripts uh, when they change things. So that sucks. Uh, I'm currently using it on Mobian and maintain a set of ARM64 build scripts I use to build my version at uh, a GitLab link that we'll put in our show notes, Signal Desktop Builder. Just figured I should send the update through because so many people have Signal as their reason for not using the PinePhone as a daily driver. 
Thanks for the podcast. Each episode is better than the last. Regards, Undef. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, I will definitely have to check it out. I tried it once, I think, to build Signal Desktop, but yeah, I gave up. It took forever and failed <laughs> when I tried it, but I think his uh, script might help with that. And sadly, I, I don't use Signal, so I, I can't do much testing on my side. Perhaps I should, <laughs> but uh, no, I don't have a phone number either, so... <laughs> yeah and that makes it a bit tough just a bit yeah but yeah I, I, it's really nice of you to have uh shared your uh your your building scripts here they're really nice i, I bet totally um sharing is caring sharing is indeed caring and now let's go on with the listener questions so we've got two new questions we're going to discuss and they both are about uh potential products mm -hmm. uh, so the first one was asked by Joe Grime uh, who's on mastodon.social I bet he likes my poems or jokey rhyme yeah. uh, sorry for butchering your name <laughs> we have a name butchering episode today oh, yeah. um, he or they ask uh, what would you like to see in a PinePhone 2 or PinePhone 2 Pro. Under what conditions, e.g. time frame, etc., would you think is a good time for such a device to be announced or released? Well, uh, PinePhone 2 Pro? There isn't even a PinePhone Pro as of now, so <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about there. Um, yeah. I mean, it's pretty clear from what we've read, that a Pine Phone 2 is rather likely to going to be based on the RQ RK3566 system on a chip, uh, unless things with that Quad64 line of devices should go terribly wrong, <laughs> right? Uh, so I think we can look forward to more RAM, for even 8 gigabytes of RAM are possible with this chipset and I would also consider similar form factor likely mm -hmm. as case molds are quite expensive and with all these accessories that Pine64 is working on I doubt that they want to redo all of them after a short time so accessory compatibility would be really nice and appreciated by both customers and I think for themselves too, because then they don't have to test new keyboards again. Right? This has been taking quite a while mm -hmm. already, and so it's not easy to get those <laughs> accessories right. I would also expect to stay that uh, to see that Cractal EG twenty five dash G modem around. Uh, so that is something I think unless Quackle stops making those, it will be in the PinePhone 2 as well. 5G, if at all, would be a feature for a hypothetical PinePhone 2 Pro uh, or Pro 2, whatever. <laughs> um, I think the benefits of this are clear. There's an open source firmware in development, which by then will likely be more ready for everybody, and it's a known piece of hardware, so bugs and stuff are known. They know how to put this on a board and make it working. Mm -hmm. Time frame. <laughs> Component shortage, guys. So, <laughs> uh, I wouldn't expect this uh, before mid-2023 at the earliest. But, of course, I would love to be proved wrong by an earlier release. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you think? Uh, I think it's so fun how we need to use our creativity to work around the problem of limited hardware. Yeah. I also think, like you were saying, like we don't even have a PinePhone 1 Pro. We don't even have a PinePhone 1. Really. <laughs> it's just a PinePhone. It's just a PinePhone. <laughs> but, like, you know, the hardware is, sure, pretty final, but, like... Can we at least get the software running before we jump like and abandon 
the like I don't know. Yeah. It's not done yet. It's, it's... And part of that software work will start again. Mm-hmm. Like all this hardware enablement runs this system on a chip. Mm-hmm. Getting stuff like the not only the GPU to work, but then the VPU. That's going to take a while. Uh also for that uh RK thirty five sixty six. Mm-hmm which is still in early support. I think we talked about it last episode, so there's no way to get display out right now, mm-hmm. if I'm not totally wrong. So, yeah, that wouldn't be great in a phone. So even though they could design a board and put that chip on there and ship it, uh, nobody would want a Pine Phone 2, which uh, has... <laughs> doesn't show anything on your screen right mm-hmm. that's no problem you just ssh in <laughs> right <laughs> easy <laughs> but joke rhyme jokey rhyme is not ready with uh done with this question there's also uh another line in his brief or in their brief to it uh and it's same questions for the pine book slash pine book pro <laughs> well okay uh, Pinebook 2, um, likely same ship set as we said before. Time frame, I don't know. The Pinebook was made before the Pine phone, so if history were to repeat itself, it might become a reality sooner than Pine phone, but what would that be? Maybe late 2022? Mm-hmm. But with market forces at work in the component shortage and in general, would the demand for Pine Phone 2 or Pine Book 2 be larger? And then what would be easier to make, as in easier to source? I frankly have no idea hmm. when this would happen. I don't know. Maybe maybe a laptop is easier mm-hmm. than a phone, so it might happen earlier. Um, but really, that's just a guess. Pinebook 2, a Pinebook Pro 2, well, again, we don't really know. Uh, so a likely and awesome system on the ship would be Rockship's 8 nanometer RK3588. You heard me correctly here. 3588, not 3566. <sighs> if only they had different names. <laughs> <laughs> um if that makes it to market sometime. So it's quite delight already. Um, so, yeah, really unlikely to happen this year, I think. Maybe next year. But when? No idea. Um, and I guess that Pine64 would first release, or at least announce and release uh, a, sy- a single board computer with that same chipset, right? Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, I think 2022 next year is optimistic. <laughs> uh, really optimistic. Maybe too optimistic. But then with that chip, uh, which features four Cortex A6, A76 and four Cortex A55 cores, more than 4 gigabytes of RAM would become a possibility. Other than that, from what I can gather, a touch improvement would be welcome. But yeah, um, that's all I can say or speculate here. You know, it might be totally different. These are just specs and we consider likely and those specs determine when a time frame would be likely and guessing time frames in 2021 has become really difficult. I mean, it's difficult anyway, Mm -hmm. but the supply problems um, just make it totally chaotic. I think that was the right word to use. Chaotic. Yeah. Hmm. Well, Let's not think about that and move on to the next question. <laughs> Good idea. Goldfinch at Fostadon asks a similar question. <laughs> Guess we won't be moving away. Um, <clears throat> what are some future products you guys would like to see from Pine64? Mm. 
I know you guys aren't big into Laurelan, so I was wondering if there was anything you guys would like to see in the future. Everyone wants a Pinephone Pro, so you can't say that. Love the show. Well, if we were to pick something like original, or if I were to pick something original that uh, Pine64 should make, it should be an <laughs> AR VR headset. It'd be Yay. nice. It'd be really nice to have one that wasn't made by sucker bears. But, you know, and it shouldn't be too hard either. I mean, I could do it. You know, it's just I don't, I don't have the time. But it would be, <laughs> it'd be interesting <laughs> if they, uh, if they made something for software developers to, to, to experiment with. Otherwise, another thing I would personally really like to experiment with would be more risk 5 more risk 5 things products just information i don't know i just have risk 5 stuff man it'd be really cool i think to experiment with that both of those things something 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 bought ships risk 5 yeah <laughs> <laughs> so it's good <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh now i'm I haven't been really gung ho about Laura, right? But I think I still think that a Laura communicator thing, mm -hmm. like what we talked about earlier, that would be quite interesting and fun. Mm -hmm. um, then, of course, PineTap 2 or PineTap Pro would be nice to see because, you know, writing that uh, tablet post I wrote there for my blog made me appreciate the pine tap more because I figured, okay, yeah, I get it. There's really not much that he can't install Linux on. And there's not much at this price point that's somewhat decent. So yeah, pine tap two, pine tap pro would be nice to see. Or just pine tap being available again. <laughs> um then of course an e-reader because e-readers um well, they are not made by sucker bears, but uh, they are usually encumbered with tons of DRM, and it would be nice to have one that's proper uh, made to run Linux because we have pretty decent ebook apps already with uh, stuff like KO Reader. And that would be interesting, at least to me, because I sometimes read. Uh, then something I would like to see would be an upgrade board for the OG Pinebook uh, with that chipset that's in the Quad 64, which we talked about earlier. <laughs> uh, maybe even modular with that so Quartz compute module. That would be cool. And then, yeah, I went down that rabbit hole while I was thinking about that because I really would like to see modular hardware that's user upgradable, environmentally friendly, environmentally friendly and that would reduce e-waste, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there are others that do s such stuff like there's a German startup in Berlin that's called MNTMN. They do stuff like that with their Reform 2 laptop, um, which is, well, if you just look at the specs, and the price, you're like, oh, that's super expensive. But then they are working on uh, systems on a module so that you can upgrade this thing. Like, I don't know, one with a rather similar but more powerful um, system on a chip. And then one with like an FPGA and stuff like that. So that's modular hardware is quite cool. Mm -hmm. Um, there are other projects that tried that too, like EOMAR 68. Um, <laughs> I'm still waiting on hardware I ordered in August of 2016, <laughs> by the way. Uh, if anybody at Crowd Supply listens to this, well, no, it's, uh, it's fine. I mean, I supported the idea. And if that ever arrives, that Orbana A20 thing, I'm going to be really happy and make a video about it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you do. But that's likely all I'm going to do with it because <laughs> it's going to be really slow. <laughs> uh, yeah. Now, modularity, of course, introduces design challenges and thus cost. Mm -hmm. But I really would love to see Point 64 going 
into that direction a bit more. Um, and so quartz is definitely an excellent step into that direction, just as so pine and that other little board they had before that I can't think of right now were so. I really hope that's more more is going to happen in that direction. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I agree. Uh, modularity is oh, it's so cool. And like you say, if it can reduce e-waste too. Yeah, but then, I mean, even if it's not modular, something like upgrade boards mm-hmm. so that you don't have to, um, you know, when you're saying like, oh, the OG Pine book with its two gigabytes of RAM... Uh, it's obsolete, but it has this 1080p screen because there were a few yeah. units at least that had 1080p screens. <clears throat> um, so I would like to keep that and the keyboard. Well, it was fine. So if I only had a different board, I could use this a lot more. That would be cool. Yeah, yeah, I agree 100%. I think that concludes our 12th episode. If you are subscribed to our MP3 feed, Check out the chapter markers, right? These can be handy if you vaguely remember something we may have talked about and want to find it again quickly, or if you find a segment really boring and want to skip it. If you don't need these chapter markers, save some bandwidth and use Peter's beloved Opus version. What's more, a huge thanks to NerdZoom Media for being our awesome audio producers. Thank you. And that's it for this episode. Thank you for listening, and we'll be back in two weeks. Remember, this is a community podcast, so please leave your feedback on what we should do better, get your suggestions in, and feel free to ask questions. Uh, We are really close to running out of questions, as always. Uh, we have some left, <laughs> but answering them is basically a full episode. So if you have any little things you'd like to know about or just know our opinions on, please do. You can join the Discord channel Pine Talk Dash Podcast on Pine 64's Discord. You can send us an email at pinetalk at pine64.org and tweet at us. We are at TalkPine. We've joined Macedon a while ago, and it's great to ask us questions, as many people have been doing. We're at talkpine at fosterdon.org. If you can't remember these names, just use the hashtag AskPineTalk also. And this is no longer new, but still way underused. We now have a thread for feedback and questions on the Pine64 forums. Please post your questions there. It's in the community section and will be linked in the show notes of this episode. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.